All right. There we go. I think we're live now. All right. So thank you everyone um, for being here today. I'm going to switch my view here. There we go. All right. So thanks everyone, um, whether you're here on the Zoom or you're in the Facebook group with us. Um, but we are here with author Cindy Fiesel tonight to talk about her book, After the Cheering Stops, um, which was our first book in the book club. And it has been so fun to see everybody's um, feedback. I think somebody just came in and needs to mute themselves. Um, there we go. Yep, everybody should be muted as I hop in here. Okay, so um, it's been so fun to watch all the discussion in the group and see, um, you know, how how everybody reacts a little bit differently to the book. So it's going to be really fun to have Cindy here tonight. Um, I've known Cindy a couple of years. When did your book come out? Um, it came out, it'd be three years this November. So we've known each other since yeah. prior because yeah. we started talking about it prior to that. Yeah. So I'm super excited to have her here. We've gotten to know each other really well over the last few years. And um, we see each other when we're out in DC for brain injury month. And I got the chance to spend time with her in Texas um, on a trip out there a few years ago. So really excited to have her here. And I think it's really cool for you guys to be able to get to hear things straight from the mouth of the author. Um, especially when it's such a, a personal um, memoir journey of a book. Um, so Cindy, thank you so much for being here. Um, and for everyone that is watching, um, I have the chat open here in Zoom. So if you're on Zoom, there is a little chat box at the bottom that you can pop up. And if you are in Facebook, um, you can just comment on the, on the Facebook Live and I can see those. I'll be monitoring um, those as we go today. Um, so first of all, Cindy, why don't you just sort of give us your introduction? I know everybody's read the book and they probably feel like they know you, but um, I'd love for you to just give a little intro of who you are and what called you to write this book. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it so much because I just love talking about um, what happened. I was in the dark for so many years, so now that I feel like I'm in the light and I understand uh, so much more about what happened during my 29 years married to Grant, that um, I just always am so thankful for every opportunity that I have to share. And um, what led me to write the book, because I, I had never written a book before, and Although I loved reading and writing and I spent years journaling and that's really what led me to writing this book because when I found out that Grant had CTE after death, stage three CTE, and I went to the Mayo Clinic and I looked at all the symptoms of CTE, it astounded me. I mean, literally took my breath away when I thought about all the events in my journals that I journals all, journaled all the years prior it fit the symptoms of CTE and it just, it just was something I had to do. I couldn't, I couldn't set on it. I, I had to see if there was anybody out there. I mean, that was really the biggest question. Is there anybody out there that feels the same way I do and it's been through anything like I've been through? So that's really what led me to write. Yeah. And what year did Grant uh, pass away? He died in 2012. 2012. And so that was before I was on my own TBI journey. Um, I had mine in 2014 and I didn't really even know anything till about 2015. It took me over a year to even realize, you know, there was all these other people out there. Yes. Um, and then, you know, learning about CTE and the movie Concussion yes. um, really helped, I think, open a lot of people's eyes to it. Um, you know, in hindsight, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, after he had already died and had been autopsied and found to have CTE. And like you said, stage three, um, there's only four stages, right? Yes, there's only four stages. And a lot of people give me flack when I say Grant had the sta same stage as Aaron Hernandez, who killed somebody. And, and I've had people say to me, how could you dare compare Grant to Aaron Hernandez? They both had the same stage CTE. 
And so what you have to go back again is look at those stages and realize that it causes all sorts of, of anguish that's going on inside their mind. And um, it's not that I'm comparing him to a criminal, but I'm just saying that it is, it's eye-opening for the public to see that this is what happens inside the body mm -hmm. and inside the brain. Um, I looked at the symptoms on the Mayo Clinic website just because that's, I always thought that the Mayo Clinic knew everything, you know, so that's where I went. <laughs> and so they say that, um, and so does everybody else, that difficulty thinking, impulsive behavior, depression, short-term memory loss, difficulty planning and carrying out small tasks. Grant couldn't, he, he would make lists and he would lose the list. Now I do that too, but I'm just saying he, he was working a, a job that was really high stress and important and he couldn't, he couldn't keep up with receipts. He couldn't keep up with anything. It was very frustrating to him. Um, emotional instability, substance abuse. Well, Grant died of cirrhosis of the liver, but he still had stage three CTE. So that started making more sense to me that substance abuse was actually, uh, you know, one of the symptoms of CTE or could be irritability, aggression, speech difficulties. And I just want to talk about that for two seconds. He had started really stammering a lot and I couldn't figure out what in the world was going on with him. Of course, I thought everything was a symptom to the alcohol. And um, so that's when it was so surprising to me when his brain came back to have CTE and I was pouring over all the information that I realized that the speech difficulty could have been a symptom of CTE as well. You know, so all of the symptoms kind of mimicked each other. And it was really difficult for me to, um, to accept that I'd been so angry with him because he couldn't get sober. And I realized, of course, after he died, that that, that was why. It was, yeah. it's, been, it's been really hard for me. I have to just kind of get up every day, not kind of, I get up every day and just forgive myself, you know, try to let it go. Because um, I know he would be proud of me for doing this work that I'm doing and spreading awareness. And that's why I'm so passionate about it, because I just know that he's watching. I know that he knows that um, I'm passionate about trying to help someone else understand this disease. So Cindy, if, if somebody's watching this and they suspect that their spouse might have CTE and, you know, they played, you know, maybe high school, maybe college football or any other impact sport or, you know, race car driver, BMXer, skateboarder, you know, all those mm -hmm. high impact sports. Right. Um, so if they're watching this and they suspect their spouse um, might have CTE, uh, you know, the, the spouse is struggling with whether it's alcohol or drug addiction or, you know, a, a thing that comes up a lot is cheating. Um, they're cheating on the spouse. Um, you know, what are, what are some uh, words of advice that you would give to the person watching? You know, like, you, like in hindsight, you know, it was the disease right. and you had no idea and so therefore you didn't know what kind of help to get. Like even, like even if you'd have gone to marriage counseling, it probably wouldn't have helped, no, right? Because we did go to marriage disease. counseling. Yeah, right. we went to marriage counseling and we would come home and Grant would get drunk. <laughs> and it would frustrate me so bad. Uh, by the way, Grant was, he was drugs and alcohol. He got hooked on opiates when he was in the NFL. And so Grant was drugs and alcohol. Even though he died of cirrhosis, he was also taking a lot of painkillers over the years because he was in pain. Um, I don't know if that pain was due to the CTE or if it was just everything because of the fact that he played football for 10 years and 117 games in the NFL on top of playing from age eight to 32. I mean, that was a lot of years. He played center. Um, his head was down. He did all the extra points and field goals. So he had added stress that some of the players may not have. But now we understand that it's every hit counts. Um, repetitive hits to the head cause brain trauma. I say it every day, usually. Parents think that because their kids haven't had a concussion, and maybe even as a spouse, you think, well, my husband never told me he had a concussion. So... Um, he, I don't think he has CTE. I mean, I think as a society, we want to we want to shun CTE and say it's not real because we love sports. We love football. We love soccer. We love BMX biking, racing, all the things you talked about. We love all of those things. And also, you can get a concussion by tripping and falling, as you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we can get a concussion anyway. 
but it's that high impact sport that is really uh, susceptible to concussions and just the shaking of the brain. And so if I say to any of the spouses out there listening, if you're thinking that your husband has this disease, you can't fight it. Uh, it is a dead end. It's a death sentence. You can't fix it. And my advice after all of these years, Amy, has changed somewhat because I used to, to give a lot of advice on what I would do with a spouse, but now my advice has turned more to what I would do with me. Um, I have learned that you've got to take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I did that in the end, but I always say that I got to the point where I felt like one of us were going to die, either me or Grant, because we were so combustible and he was so scary with the disease and his brain illness that um, we were bad for each other. So I walked away. Now, I don't, I'm not encouraging that. I'm just saying you have to protect yourself. And, and take care of you. If it gets to be a, a, a situation where it's scary and you can't, um, you know, you can't control it. Grant was six, seven. It didn't matter how skinny he was or how messed up he was. He was still bigger than me. So um, he got to a point where he was scary to me. So I say, you've got to protect yourself. Even if you're continuing to live with him, and I did for many, many years with him in, in, in a declining condition, I didn't pay attention to myself. You have to remember, there has to be someone that you talk to. You need to go to a therapist. You need to be going to Al-Anon. You need to be going somewhere and confiding in a professional organization or person what is going on with you. Um, you know, I did seek a counselor. And I have to say that the counselor, you know, was part of the, the thing that really saved my life because um, they continued to talk to me and tell me and keep me grounded. So, you know, you've got to remember that you have to reach out. You can't fix this. That's my biggest um, takeaway from tonight. If you think that your husband or your loved one has this disease, you personally cannot fix it. Um, and you can't take it personal. I took it personal. See, I thought it was the alcohol and I was so angry that Grant couldn't get sober. Um, I was taking it personal. I was saying, why can't you get sober for us? Why can't you get sober for me? Because I knew he loved me, and I, I still know until his last breath that he loved me. Um, so I'm completely at peace with all of that. But I just wish that I could, have ex I could have expressed to him, Grant, I know that you can't help yourself. See, I, I never said that to him. I, 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 was, I was more upset with him than anything else because I just kept thinking he was not concentrating on getting sober. And really, he couldn't. Mm -hmm. He just couldn't. Yeah. And I think, you know, saying fix yourself first, take care of yes. yourself. Yes. I think that's a really powerful statement because I think too many people try to change the other person. Yes. You, know, you need to quit drinking. You need to quit doing this. You need to quit doing that. And like they can't, they, they can't. literally can't. They can't. They can't. And, and it's so empowering when you realize that you can take care of you. Um, and I have really tried to do that since Grant's death, research CTE and be passionate about talking about CTE, but I'm still trying to recover myself from what I lived through. And so these, all you ladies that are out there taking care of your husbands, um, just know that it, it really wears and tears on you. It's, a, it's very destructive to you and your body as well. So just don't lose yourself. Keep trying to um, research what's going on. And there's a lot of scientific evidence out there. So it's very important that you keep yourself up to date on what's happening, but don't get lost in taking care of yourself. You have to do that. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts? You know, I, I've seen quite a few people comment that they're worried they have CTE um, at, or that their doctors told them they probably yeah. have CTE. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you, and I'm talking someone more like me who just had a really bad injury. Like I haven't mm -hmm. had the, the subconcussive hits um, such as a football player. Um, you know, what advice do you have for those people? Um, I think is really my own opinion, um, I think is really destructive 
uh, and counterproductive for doctors to tell people they have CTE. Um, Me too. Okay. Yeah. So you can't be diagnosed until you're autopsy. So why are these doctors telling people that they have it um, when you can't tell for sure until you do an autopsy? I mean, I, I try to battle it every day with different conversations that I'm having with people trying to say, you don't know if you have it. You, you, you know you have the symptoms, and we I just read the symptoms, so if you're symptomatic, you know that, but you certainly don't know until the pathology report is in. Mm -hmm. So um, I do think it's good to arm yourself with the information, but be careful saying, my husband has CTE, or my wife has CTE, or I think I have CTE, because I know that we wanna put a label on everything, but you really can't tell for sure until, until you're dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you touched on it earlier, how parents don't really want to admit that their kid could have, um, uh, you know, be causing damage, right? And I just saw somebody post, like in the last week, how they bought their child this like brand new helmet. I did that's too. Supposed I to be concu that. Maybe you shared it. I bet that's where I no, read it. No, I didn't share it. I don't think, but I saw it and I was like, why, I, this, it made me feel so sad that this person thinks that she's protecting or they're protecting their child. And I will even say this, Grant Fiesel bought our kids, our two sons that played football, the best football helmet that there was being made at the time our boys played because he was concerned about the brain, really. And he had talked some about it and said, you know, I want our kids to have these state-of-the-art helmets. So all the rest of the kids had, you know, plain old helmets at the high school, but our kids had the best. But it doesn't matter because there's never going to be a helmet made and there isn't a helmet made. And I have people, helmet makers, people constantly haggling, asking me, um, for, you know, talk about my product. Talk about this. It's different than all the rest. There is not a helmet made that's going to protect butter or jello. And your brain is like butter or jello. And I can tell you this, that Grant was a pre-med major. And if he'd had any idea I mean, they must have never talked about this in his pre-med classes, because if he'd known, he would have been so terrified, he would have quit playing professional football, he would have never let our sons play, because he was a safety freak, okay? He wanted to spray off on when he went outside so he could get bit by a bug. So he was, he was um, very safety conscious. He would never have let our kids do something that would have hurt them. And more than anything, he loved me. And he loved our kids so much that he would have never played a sport that he thought would have shortened his life with us. I mean, I, in, in my heart of hearts, I know this. Um, I know we grew apart and we had this huge barrier because of this disease and the alcoholism and drug addictions. But Grant loved me and he would have never done any of those things if he did not ever play football because I know that football damaged his brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel bad for any of these parents that are being sold a bill of goods and going out there and buying expensive helmets for their sons because it is not going to protect your child's brain. Period. Yeah. And and I'm gonna, I'm on my soapbox just a little bit, as you can tell. But Amy, I am just saying this to I have a lot of friends that want to say flag until 14, but I can't do that because in my mind I have to say uh, you know, if you're going to play flag football, you should play until 18. I, I, I think flag football is a, is a definite better alternative. So yes, if you're going to play football, play flag football until you're 18 years old. And then in the world standards, when you're 18 years old, you're considered an adult. So Dr. Amalu says, and I say the same thing that he says, if you want to play football when you're 18, you're old enough to have gathered enough information because you're a, an adult. And so you've gathered your information by then. And if you want to play a head banging sport, you go for it because you know by then what the dangers are, are because you can look it up yourself. And so I just say 18. I, I don't even say 14. I don't think football is a good idea ever. So I, I, I'm sorry. That's just my, my opinion, along with Dr. Omalu, who I think, by the way, knows his stuff. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I can't even watch football. Me I remember, I remember um, so my accident happened in February. So football didn't start again until what, September, October? Oh, and yeah. I just remember. I'm right now. <laughs> I yes, just remember. 
I just remember being like, oh, that just hurts watching it. Like how, how can they even go back on the field after that? I know. Like, you know, like it was just so painful to watch. I know. And Amy, here's the other thing that I keep thinking to myself, and I would love to have this conversation with Grant if he were here. I would love to say, do you remember all the times that you would come in and you would say, well, I got my bell rung today, or I got a little ding. And, and he was saying this when we were in college, because, you know, we dated in college and we were married his, our, his senior year and the last year he played football. So I, I mean, I watched a million, jillion, trillion football games. Okay. <laughs> and so he would say, I got my bell rung and I would think, Oh, I mean, he would explain that that meant that he got a concussion. And I can remember thinking this. This is so terrible. Oh, well, you don't have a cast on and you're not on crutches, so you're good. I literally thought that. And I think he did too, because there were never any kind of, you know, protocols or yeah. any kind of precautions or anything like that. The only thing they did is break out the smelling salts and get him back out there to play again. And I know even now, players. You know, they're not supposed to lead with their head, but they will because they'd rather get a concussion than tear an ACL or break an arm because then they're out for six to eight weeks for sure. Yeah. yeah. And you know, Amy, I can't feel sorry for players now in the NFL. I can't feel sorry really for high school players, college players, because listen, I have a little nephew that just turned 12 and we had this conversation yesterday. He said, Cindy, you're all over YouTube. You are telling everybody that you can think of about, about what football can do to, to the brain and, and what it did to Grant. So at, at 12 years old, if he can already go to YouTube and he can Google football and what it does to the brain, I mean, they, kids Google everything, right? Mm -hmm. They go to YouTube for everything. We go to YouTube, we go to Google about if we want to get a new pair of tennis shoes, what brand it is, what the reviews are. We go to Amazon, we look at the reviews. So it's hard for me to feel sorry for even a kid in high school at this point, college, professional, because the evidence is out there. It's everywhere. All you have to do is type brain injury in with football, and it'll give you tons of scientific evidence. So I just have a hard time um, with parents that act like they don't know what this is, because a parent, if they were going to go get a tattoo, they would Google what a tattoo might do to them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. So why wouldn't you Google this? Yeah. Yeah. So anyone that's watching either on Zoom or on Facebook, if you have any questions for Cindy, please type them into the chat or the comment on Facebook. Um, I'm sure some of you probably have questions um, after reading her book, After the Cheering Stops. Um, such a good book. I, it, I remember reading it um, and just, you know, getting inside your head and like what on earth you must have felt like going through this and you know just it's so powerful to think how you knew nothing about CTE like you said he'd he'd say he got his bell rung and you know what did that mean that didn't mean anything no. um and even now they still will use that term oh he didn't have a concussion he just got his bell rung well yeah. no that is a concussion and, and a concussion is a brain injury. And yes. that's kind of one of my soapboxes is, yes. you know, I wish doctors would stop saying concussion and, you know, you have a brain injury because, yes. oh, my kid, he's fine. He can play. It's just a concussion. You know, now imagine saying my kid can play. It's just a brain. It's just a mild brain injury. That sounds ridiculous, right? It, it does. And I really think that the sports industry put that word concussion as a buzzword. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. sports controls everything. Think about it. Cities are made around stadiums and all sorts of money is involved in sports. And so, um, you know, they don't want to talk about it. Why didn't my pediatrician tell me when I said that my boys were going to start playing at age 10? Why didn't my pediatrician give me some information to look up about brain um, damage that it could do and the trauma that it could do to the brain? My pediatrician never brought any of that up. Mm -hmm. And did your kids play just high school or did they play college too? No, I hate to say this, but my kids played from age 10 all the way through college. So um, I worry. I worry all the time 
my boys had serious concussions and I will have to say that I feel like a negligent mom because I too did not know what was going on even when my boys had these concussions. And I, I just kind of, I, I mean, my boys had broken arms, they had broken wrists and different broken bones when they played sports. And I remember making a bigger deal out of that than I did yeah. the concussion. And it makes me sick to my stomach, literally makes me so sad. I, I just, it, it's heartbreaking to me. I feel like, um, you know, it's one of those things I have to let go because yeah. otherwise it would make me, um, it make me crazy thinking that I was that kind of parent because I was so safe conscious. And so was Grant really that, um, to think that we let our boys uh, play a game that could have been damaging to their brain. And, and what we don't realize, so many people don't realize is that this degenerative brain disease, it also can lead into ALS and Parkinson's and dementia yeah. and um, Alzheimer's. So all of these brain degenerative brain diseases can be brought on by sports injury. And so that makes me sad that I let my children play a sport that could give them a long-term health effect in the future. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I know you're familiar with CTE Hope and Zach Easter's story yes. and how he only played high school. Yes. Um, and I can't remember what position he played, um, but he only played high school. And, so you know, unfortunately, the doctors told him he had CTE and there's nothing to do for it. Um, and he had turned to drugs and alcohol and he, he, he journaled. He kept a very detailed journal and he shot himself in the chest. So that his brain could be autopsied, um, you know. It, it makes you crazy. I, I mean, if I could say this loud on a loudspeaker to everyone in the United States that lets their child do a head banging sport, if you if your child gets this disease, it makes you crazy. I mean, um, so many people, as we've seen with NFL players and like with Zach Easter and high school players, we know so many families who've lost their children in high school. Um, young adults, not even in high school, but in their 20s. Um, it maddens you. It, I mean, Grant would, um, he just, he looked, he, he, he had a lost look in his eyes. I can't explain it. There's something about the eyes. Um, it's, it's so telltelling that I think people are afraid to be around me at some point. If they've been in a, a headbanging sport for a long time, they have a hard time around me because they think I'm trying to read their eyes, you know? And I do because it's, it's a dead look in the eyes. Yeah. And it, it's so scary. And, and it's so, I think it just internally makes, makes you crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to high school and college with a boy and he played football in high school. And I remember in college, he just became really reckless and, mm -hmm. and made really poor decisions. And I think he ended up dropping out and like, nobody even knows where he is anymore. And he was very popular in high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, he was, yes. just being, you know, not, I'm not saying he had CTE, but he definitely had a brain injury, right? Yes. He was and showing signs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look back at that and it's like, oh, wow, that's, that's what was happening. And you shared a video just the other day um, from Good Morning America about Tom Brady and yes. jumping with his daughter oh, and like goodness. the internet Seriously. went crazy. Um, and I'm like, oh yeah. Like in the NFL. I know. Not <laughs> admit good that decisions. this exists. <laughs> no, it's just, um, it's so easy for us to see when we've been around it and we've, um, we, we understand brain injury. It's so easy for us to see, but I just think that parents, especially who love football, especially in the state of Texas, everybody loves football here and they don't want to look at me. They don't want to talk to me. They want to act like I'm a hot potato and I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist. Okay. I get that. But I'm also somebody that lived through this disease uh, with a man that was very sick. And so um, I think that's worth a little something. And so if I had a friend or a relative whose husband had died and had stage three CTE, I'd be going, oh my gosh, I'm going to take my kid out of this sport because I wouldn't do anything right. to, if it, you know, if it would happen to my son. I would never want it to happen to my son. I worry about it with my own boys. So I'm just saying... To be a responsible parent in 2019, and I say it every day, look, 
look at the information. Don't take it from me. Um, don't take it from the uh, we any website that you look at. Just go to go to the scientific evidence and look at that. It's everywhere. Dr. Amalu has so much um, to talk about. Dr. Amon, there's so many credible brain doctors that have great information. Go there. Go there. Um, so we have a question. Uh, Sherry wrote, I love the book. My son has had numerous concussions in his earlier years. What should we be watching for in his adult years as CTE signs? Well, I mean, I worry about this with my own sons. I, I just, I hate to say this, but what I, what I do and what I would do if I were you is I would just pull up that the signs and symptoms off of the Mayo Clinic website. You can, you can get it from a lot of different places. You can just type into your computer signs and symptoms of CTE and just kind of keep that on. I keep it on an index card just like this. And so if ever I have a friend who um, sends me a message or if I just have a question internally about my own, my own family, I look at these and I just kind of go down the list and I start thinking, okay, um, does this fit our child or does this fit your child? So I think that having those symptoms written out on something like an index card and just having it close by to pull out keeps you thinking. Um, because I think we have a tendency to just let symptoms go, oh, was that really a symptom? Or, you know, they're just acting bad today. So I think that if you have this in front of you and it says on top, the Mayo Clinic CTE symptoms, I think that um, that just keeps you focused and thinking, okay, my son is just irritable. I don't know, I don't know why. He can't ever, he's not ever happy. He seems to be drinking more. Um, he's taking pills. So, you know, you can look at all of these things and just kind of do a checklist. So I would just keep that as a handy mental checklist because I think that it's important to um, remind yourself that this is real and um, not, not put those symptoms to the side and, and act like maybe it's just a, an isolated thing and didn't happen. I know I was doing that with Grant drinking so much I was thinking oh he's not really drinking that much <laughs> you know we have a tendency to not want this to be what is happening yeah. so I, I find it's better if I have it written out so it just reminds me and you know with Grant too I remember reading how in your early years he didn't drink at all or you know just no. the occasional drink yeah um, I mean a beer after a football yeah. game or whatever but it was never I had never seen him drunk yeah. So I was so astounded the first time, you know, that he just got wasted when we were at a party and he was so big and trying to get him in the car and he was so sick all the way home because he was, he, he had so much to drink setting down and then got up and realized how much he had, had had to drink. So it was really frightening to me when he started drinking a lot and getting drunk a lot. Yeah. And, and so what advice would you have for someone who is dealing with a spouse or it could be their child or, you know, a friend um, who, you know, they know that they played a sport or that they had a brain injury of some sort and they're abusing alcohol or drugs. What advice would you have for them? Well, first of all, I'm going to go back to what we talked about earlier. You've got to take care of yourself because um, that's just huge. I became a codependent and I talked about it a little bit in the book, but seriously, I could write a whole book about it and might someday because codependency is so, so huge. And I'm just learning about codependency even after Grant's death, I've learned more and more and more about myself, Amy. I mean, I had an internal issue of denial. Yeah. I had a problem. I had a huge problem, so huge with codependency, trying to make everybody think that everything was still okay in our life that I, I think that I, I did a lot of damage and destruction to our family as well. So I'm taking a huge, huge chunk of that whole family destroying thing that happened in our house. I'm taking a lot of that on myself because codependents don't do anybody a favor by acting like it's not happening. So you have to take care of yourself. Get into Al-Anon, get into therapy. Start going to meetings once a, you know, once a day or once a night, two times a week, three times where they're talking about you taking care of yourself. You have to do that, first of all. Then I would say, you know, for Grant, it was important for me to get him into some sort of rehab facility. Even though I don't think he could have ever gotten sober, um, 
I think that it helped our family seeing that he was trying to do something to help himself. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm saying that the rehab didn't work for him. He went four times. He never could get sober. But I do think that you have to try to get your loved one in some sort of a program. I just think you do. I mean, I could have never lived with myself if I hadn't have tried to get Grant into somewhere um, to help him. So, you know, he was bigger than me, of course, too. We, we had to do an intervention to get him in. He wasn't happy. He never was happy going. So it's hard, and it's hard on the spouse when you're trying to get them into rehab. So again, you've got to look at your own self and address yourself and your issues with codependency, trying to deny all of this, first of all. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, alcohol and drugs, they, you know, I just have to believe, there's a lot of research being done, um, but I just have to believe that they, amplify the disease as well. Um, you know, yes. like they're, they're already studying the opioids and is that actually causing the CTE itself? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when you combine that with those hits and a brain injury and alcohol right. and drugs, and it's right. a horrible, horrible recipe. Oh, it's horrible. And I think it causes the decline to be so much faster. Right. Because some people say to me, well, what about, you know, Bob Lilly and Roger Staubach and all these great players of the past, you know, that played years ago, you don't ever hear about them having CTE. Well, um, I don't know. I just think that that if you if you get into the drugs and alcohol, that's going to speed your death up for sure. Mm -hmm. And so um, I also want to say too that it's so important that people remember if your child kills themselves, please have their brain looked at because it wasn't just an isolated incident. I mean, this is something that all parents that their children commit suicide. If your spouse commits suicide, please have their brain checked out. Um, and an autopsy, because it, the longer the line we get of a timeline of damaged brains, the more we're going to be able to understand. If people keep burying their people and, and never checking into what the brain autopsy looks like, um, it just delays evidence for all the rest of us, you know, really. So mm -hmm. men and women, um, even because I have a lot of women that play soccer and, and have played soccer and they send me a lot of in inbox messages, talk to me on Facebook. They have serious uh, health issues as well. And so they're worried about their brain. Not enough people are talking about women and their brain. I think that needs to be talked about longer and louder. Uh, more women, more men, more children, any of that, any age group that they kill themselves um, are, are in accidents or whatever. They need to make sure that they have their brain going. Talk to your loved one. Make sure that they know you want your brain to be um, to be autopsy because it's so important for research for this disease. Mm -hmm. Right, and I know um, I've donated my well, I didn't. I haven't already donated it. Yes, um, I've done the brain donation <laughs> through the Concussion Legacy yes. Foundation, um, yes. and I just you know I'm like. I had a really bad hit, right? Yes. It took me years to get over my, my brain yes. injury. And so who knows what they'll see in there, right? And right. Um, who knows how many concussions I might have had before in my life. There's a couple incidents I can think of that were never, you know, um, uh, talked about. I, I'm right. trying to use the right word. But, you know, they were never written off as a concussion, but like definitely, I think I probably had a few when I was young. Um, mm -hmm. I got hit by a car once. Hello. I probably yes. had a concussion. Yes. So, um, but yeah, you know, and we and, don't think about it being even when we're young and we get a ding on the head for other reasons and maybe not even sports, like you're saying, we, those things can still be seen on a PET scan. And I'm hoping that in the years to come that the PET scan and the brain scans get to be more readily available for people like you and anyone else who have um, issues where they would like to see what the lesions on the brain look like. And that is available, by the way. It's not paid for by insurance and it's very expensive. And that makes me sad because there's so many people that really need the information and financially they can because of the expense. So I know. It's troubling. Um, so we have another question about how to deal with the spouse when they're driving you crazy. She said, I know it's not his fault, but I just get very impatient at times. And I see this. I'm in a 
Facebook group called um, TBI Wives, and I see it in there all the time. People are just pissed at the husband, and I get uh -huh. it. The husband has poor decision making, um, yeah. but I just kind of yeah. want to sometimes go through the screen and be like, they have a brain injury. I know. <laughs> I know. I wish you'd been there to shake me and say, he had a brain injury because I probably would have just left. I think about the fact that I got a divorce from Grant and I know people want to go, yeah, you had an affair and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, all of that was led up to from all the circumstances. Okay. I'm not saying I did the right thing, but Grant had ignored me for a long time and only fought with me. Okay. So he drove me crazy. He made me make stupid decisions myself because he made me insane. Um, I understand this question. It is so hard when the person you love, you see them self-destructive. You want to scream at them all the time, and I did. Um, and Grant was not a screamer and not a yeller, but he even got to the point where he was screaming and yelling at me because we, we were like two sticks of dynamite, okay? We just blew up every time we got around each other. And it was so odd because I always have had a personality like a pistol, okay? But Grant's personality was so calm and so kind. And people say on Facebook, Grant was a gentle giant. He was back in 1983 when they were in college with him. They didn't realize he changed. You know what I think? He, he wasn't always a gentle giant with me. <laughs> And so um, I understand the frustration with this. It's very upsetting when your loved one, you, you can't reason with them. Um, I would say that if I could go back and redo, I would just get in my car and drive away. Now, I had, I, my kids, you know, were young. And I think I stayed with Grant for a long, 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 long time because of my kids. Um, I would have to revisit that in this day and time because I've seen that I can live on my own. See, that was part of my codependency problem, thinking that I couldn't live on my own. And now I've seen I could live on my own. I could make my own way. I could have taken care of my kids with him. And so, you know, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think I was capable of doing anything myself. So just again, re-examine yourself and take care of yourself. Get in the car, drive away, go get to, you know, go have a dinner by yourself in solitude or go to a relative's house and spend the night. If you've got young kids, take them with you. Um, I mean, I think more than anything, Grant and I just needed to be apart. You know, if I'd been apart from him for maybe 48 hours when I got mad at him or angry, maybe that would have helped. I don't know. I didn't do that. I did a lot of yelling and screaming and Grant drove away drunk. Terrible. I just, I don't have good advice for that. Only, the only thing I can say is what's in hindsight, me saying, gee, I wish I'd taken care of myself more. And that's, that kind of falls into that same, I think, answer. And I really think that you would have handled it differently had you known that he yes. was dealing with this disease. Oh my um, goodness, yes. 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 If I'd had any idea he was and I know people say alcoholism is a sickness. I know that it is, but you get mad when they pick up a bottle and they choose a bottle over you. It just is, it's human nature. You know what I mean? You just get mad when you think that they've chosen alcohol over you. And that's what I continually thought. Um, the hardest thing in the world is walking away and still loving that person. Um, I walked away, still loved him. I got a divorce from him, still loved him. And I remember what he said the day we got a divorce. He said, I hope you're happy because you've ruined our life. Um, you know, I think about it all the time. <laughs> I wish I'd just left and not divorced him. I didn't know he was going to die seven months later. Trust me. Yeah. So, you know, I don't have, I didn't do everything right. I did a lot of stuff wrong, but use me as a model of what not to do. <laughs> uh, Again, I didn't have a good self-concept. I didn't understand that I was part of the problem because I was a codependent. I wasn't causing him to drink, but I irritated him. Um, and you, Amy, as, a, as someone that has a brain injury, you understand that a hyper person like me, if I was hyper around you and asking you 90 million <laughs> questions on a day, you weren't feeling good and say, when are we going to go on a vacation? When are we going to make a reservation? I would drive you nuts. So, you know, I, I, I have that kind of personality. I wake up every morning. I'm happy. I feel good. I mean, you know, I've been blessed with a cheery attitude most of the time. But uh, with Grant having a brain injury, I irritated him. And I, I 
couldn't understand what I was doing to irritate him. I thought I was pretty fun. <laughs> so, you know, we had this constant thing that was going on where I was feeling like a failure because I thought he didn't love me and I thought he was drinking because he didn't love me. Right. So it was a constant misunderstanding. Um, if I knew now what I know and I was still married to him, I would just, you know, I, I think I'd probably get my own place. I would probably just try to live separate from him for, for a while. I would try to quit. Listen, I used to follow him around to keep him from getting caught by the police drinking. I mean, I did all sorts of crazy things. We got in huge domestic fights. The police knew our, our house like the back of their hand. They were there all the time. Um, I, I tried to control Grant. So my biggest um, takeaway needs to be from you that you can't control this person. Your CTE brain damaged person, you can't control them and it just wears you down um, to try to do that. Because if they're gonna get caught by the cops, if they're gonna get arrested, and many of them do, a lot of them are in jail, um, it's not your fault. Yeah. And you can't keep it from happening. So, but it, it must be really crazy when you're a parent trying to keep this from happening because it was crazy. It was a crazy maker for me with Grant. I can't imagine if it were your child. So, um, you know, I kind of have a long distance relationship, not kind of, I do have a long dis distance relationship with my sons. They're not real happy with what I say and talk about. I think that one of the reasons why they're not is because it scares them. Um, so I'm just saying, you know, it's, it must be really hard if it's your child, but you just have to remember that you, you can have all of your knowledge. You can have your index card and you can have all of your knowledge, but you can't make them do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was such a great point about, you know, if you're all hyper and chipper and the other person's not feeling good. Like, exactly. I, mean, I experienced that. I have, you know, I, at the time I was living in an artist community and a neighbor would stop by and just be like, hey, what are you doing? How are you feeling? Want to go have coffee? And I was like, oh. me, that would be me. That would be me. <laughs> and I hear a lot of people like, you know, oh, they won't take the garbage out. That's all they had to do today. And they forgot. And it's like, yeah. hi, brain injury. I, I would do things for days or weeks at a time and exactly it's frustrating to me but yeah. then if you know I lived alone but if I'd have had somebody nagging me that I didn't do it I'd have been 10 times more frustrated so I can see how that vicious cycle you know starts it does and it makes it's it's a, a continuous crazy thing and it's damaging for your family I mean, I admit that I was a huge part of the damage for my kids because imagine what Grant and I were going through all these years and our kids were just innocent bystanders. Um, so again, that's a whole nother book, what we did to our kids. And uh, because trust me, you think your kids don't know, they know everything. I mean, they may not know what this disease is caused, but they, called, but they know that daddy had a problem um, they know that daddy couldn't be as attentive to him as they wanted him to be. Uh, you know, it causes a whole host of problems with your children because your spouse is unavailable in so many ways. I mean, think about how, how unavailable they are to you. Imagine how your children feel. Yeah. Well, Cindy, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for being my first book in the book. Oh, I'm so excited. And Amy, I just want to say this. I'm so thankful that we have a friendship and you are so um, encouraging to me because you just continue to get up and keep going even when you don't feel like it. And you do so much and you have so much available for so many people, um, resources for them to look at. And um, there's just no excuse. If people know you, then they um, know where to go to look for information. And so I just appreciate you being... Um, that kind of girl. Thank you. I appreciate that. And our next book that we're reading is Counting the Days While My Mind Slips Away by Ben Utech. And okay. I hadn't like at all thought about it. It was two NFL books in a row, but they're so different because I know they are. And they are so good. I've read his too and I've never met him. I hope that sometime along the way I can meet him because he's an encouragement to me as well. Um, I just appreciate you doing this um, so much. And also, I, can I just say real quick, 
that if anybody that read the book, if the spirit moves them to write a review on Amazon about this book, it's not for me, trust me. I, I'm doing it as a resource for people because I know how lost I was, Amy, when I was looking for some information. So I just always think that if people write a review to Amazon, when they're going to look for something that will help them, that they might see something that catch their eye. So I just say thank you so much for the great reviews they gave me on your page. Um, I appreciate them taking the time to write the things that they did. And I just uh, want to say thank you so much for that. And if you get a chance to write on Amazon, that would be incredible. That's a great point. Um, those reviews help the search engines. Yes. Uh, yes. So when people are looking for the topic and you did not have to have purchased the book on Amazon. No. A review. That's, you that's just right. need to have an Amazon account. So right. even if you didn't buy it there, even if you rented it from the library or rented it, borrowed it from the library, yeah. um, you yeah. can still leave a review as long as you have an Amazon account. So please do that. And I'll, I'll actually put a post. That's a great idea. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. And for all of your guests, it's a really good post. I mean, to get a post on Amazon, um, is so good. It just helps everybody. It gives all the people out there that are just looking for answers to brain injury, not that any of us have the answer, but just a community of where we can go and uh, learn. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So thank you, Cindy. Thank and you. I, you know, everybody make sure you get your next book. We'll start um, uh, doing discussion questions next week on Ben's book. I'm really excited to have Ben be part of the author talk series. He's insanely busy, and so I'm so happy he's willing to take time out um, to do one of these author talks like Cindy did tonight. Um, I think it'll just be so cool to get the perspective from the athlete, right? So we yes, heard Ben's story. absolutely. <laughs> and now we can hear Ben's story. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, totally different books, but yet yeah, there's the, the NFL. So um, yes. So really excited for you guys to read that one. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cindy, again. Thank Thanks, you so much. I appreciate it, Amy. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Thank you.